On October the 25th, 1983, the United States invaded Grenada. It was, some believe, a forerunner to a much bigger invasion of Nicaragua. Imagine for a moment that you and your family live in one of the poorest regions of the world, Central America, often called the backyard of the United States. It's likely your home is in the countryside, a one-room shack in which there's no lavatory, no electricity, no clean drinking water. And imagine that at least two or three times in your life you watch helpless as a brother or sister or a small son or daughter falls ill with something simple and preventable, like diarrhea or measles and dies. In your community, there's hardly anyone who can read or write except the priest and the money lender. If you're lucky, you may get a few months' work picking cotton or cutting cane for 40 pence a day from dawn to dusk. And perhaps you'll wonder why your labor produces luxury goods and food for export to self-sufficient countries like the United States and Britain while you and your family are permanently hungry. But if you wonder aloud about this, you put yourself at great risk, and you may even end up on a rubbish tip, murdered. That is what happens in the small nations of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Until 1979, it also happened in Nicaragua. Then almost all the people of Nicaragua rose up against a tyrant called Somoza, whose family had been in power for more than 40 years, put there by the United States Marines. That uprising cost 50,000 lives, almost as many as died for America in Vietnam, but out of a population of less than three million people. This film is about the people of Nicaragua and their unique struggle to end a cycle of poverty and humiliation. It is also about a threat, which according to President Reagan, this tiny country presents to the most powerful and richest nation on earth. This threat, says Reagan, is communist penetration in Central America. But the real threat is this. Children once denied education under the Samosas now have the same right to school as do children in Britain. This botany class did not exist while Samosa was in power, when even the youngest children labored in the fields. In the past four years, two and a half thousand new schools have been built. And this is the threat. These middle-aged peasant women can read and write for the first time in their lives. In the past four years, illiteracy has been cut to less than 10% of the population. And this is the threat. Polio has been wiped out. Infant mortality has been cut by a third. Serious malnutrition has been dramatically reduced. A national health service has been established in spite of pitifully meagre resources. And this is the threat. Open roads, freedom of movement. In a region of turmoil, there's no curfew, no menace from within. It is ironic that Nicaragua is one of the few countries in Latin America where the United States ambassador is able to stroll in safety through the streets. Patria libre! The uprising against Somoza embraced all classes, from right to left, rich and poor, and was led by the Sandinistas. There are a few families in Nicaragua who haven't lost a loved one in the fighting. This woman, Maria Elena, lost her son, whom she believes was tortured. She has never found his body. I tell the American people, and Reagan in particular, because I know not all the people are against us. I'd say, why doesn't this man leave us in peace? Even if it means they lend us nothing, they give us nothing at all. Because we are extremely poor people. But please, will he leave us in peace? If he'd leave us alone, this revolution could have done wonders, because even though so many things haven't been done, a lot has already been achieved. To understand events in Central America today, and the threat of an independent Nicaragua, it's important to look back. 
Won't you kindly open your geography? Let us turn to page 123. Between the Caribbean and the Pacific shore, you'll find the city of Ramon. Managua, Nicaragua is a beautiful town. You buy an hacienda for a few pesos down. Central America until recently has been in shadow largely ignored by scholars and journalists, so that the epic struggles of its peoples and the names of their heroes were lost behind a facade of ridicule, the so-called banana republics. In 1823, President Monroe proclaimed what was modestly called the Monroe Doctrine. Its aim was to protect Latin America from the Europeans, regardless of whether the people of Latin America wanted to be protected. This paternalism later became known as America's manifest destiny, that is, America's God-given right to control its own hemisphere. Early in the 20th century, manifest destiny took on a new meaning. It was now a crusade against Bolshevism, an imagined red threat in America's backyard. In 1912, US Marines landed in Nicaragua to protect democracy, as they put it, and to hold elections. But people in Nicaragua didn't want a foreign army to organize their elections, and resistance began behind a leader who said, the issue is that the United States has no right to invade and humiliate a small country. His name was Augusto Sandino. He was a liberal and a nationalist, not a Marxist. And the Americans made the mistake of dismissing him as a bandit. Central America, said U.S. Under Secretary of State Richard Olds, has always understood that governments which we recognize and support stay in power, while those we do not recognize and support fail. Major General Smedley Butler of the United States Marines later described his role with disarming frankness. I was a racketeer for capitalism, he said. I helped purify Nicaragua for international banking, I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests, and I helped make Honduras right for American fruit companies. Sandino and what was called his mad little army rejected all that. On July the 16th, 1927, he attacked the US Marines headquarters here at Ocotal in the north of Nicaragua. And that afternoon across these hills came a formation of de Havilland biplanes bearing United States markings. The planes formed into a column and dived at the center of town. With machine guns blazing, they dropped their bombs at 300 feet. And that is now believed to be the first use of organized dive bombing in history, long before the German Luftwaffe was credited with the innovation at Guernica in Spain. There were hundreds of casualties, and Sandino learned a lesson. From then on, he became a master of guerrilla warfare, of attacking and melting away, tactics which were to be adopted around the world and to change much of the world over the next 50 years. By 1933, Sandino's mad little army had defeated the Marines, driving them from Nicaragua, a lesson of history apparently overlooked today. Sandino went to Managua for peace talks, where he was betrayed by America's man, Somoza, the head of the National Guard. In 1934, he was murdered. There was a calypso sung in American nightclubs in the 1940s that began like this. A guy asked the dictator if he had any farms. The dictator said he had only one. It was Nicaragua. Anastasio Somoza founded a dynasty that ran Nicaragua like a family business for 44 years. The Somozas owned almost half of all the arable land in Nicaragua. They controlled the coffee, sugar and beef industries. Nothing was overlooked. They owned the national airline outright. If you bought a Mercedes car, you bought it from a Somoza company. Even the paving stones in the streets were made by a Somoza cement factory, which got the contract from a Somoza ministry. And of course, the profits went to El Presidente. The Somozas were protected by a private army called the National Guard, which the United States created, paid, and armed. Somoza called them his boys and they tortured almost as a sport. This is the Messiah Volcano, which 